According to Norse mythology and my drunk Swedish father, there exists a colossal and monstrous serpent. This serpent has its coils spread around the world and the world tree. It will also battle the mighty Thor to the death. He said that the world serpent is no myth. It actually exists, and he has proof. Understandably, when I heard this, I chalked it up to my dad having a little too much to drink. But then he pulled out the pictures. What I saw was nothing short of mystifying, and it made me feel incredibly small in the universe. I saw the body of a serpent that was easily dozens of feet wide and tall, spreading endlessly through a vast frozen cavern. When I asked my dad how he was even able to get such photos, or if they were real, he went silent for a minute. He then explained that it was an old friend of his, now passed away, who took them. Shortly after taking these photos and presenting them to my dad a few decades ago, his friend fell ill. It was just a fever at first, but then deafness followed, then blindness, and eventually paralysis, all in the span of 48 hours. His flesh became necrotic and dripped off his body in chunks an hour or two before his death. My father called it the Curse of Jormungandr. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today, we bring you SCP Foundation Keter Class Object SCP-722. SCP-722, also known as Jormungandr, is an enormous serpentine entity found frozen in a glacial cavern in Greenland. Hypothesized by Foundation researchers to have been sleeping since even before the 11th century, this monstrous serpent is estimated to be 8 miles long with a muscular body. However, who built the tunnels within this cavern wherein 722 sleeps? The Foundation does not know. What is known is that some portions of 722's head and tail are covered in an ancient Nordic script. Although it is partially buried and encased in glacial ice, not to mention being in deep slumber, the Foundation remains cautious. Should 722 awaken, the Foundation fears it will threaten all of humanity due to its sheer size. It is reported that people who discovered 722 quickly fell ill and died, all from being in close proximity of 722 and not necessarily touching it. If its very existence is a poison, the Foundation shudders at what else it is capable of. The following recording provides a short glimpse into what havoc may come should 722 awaken. My name is Cole, and I'm an archivist for the Foundation. Today, I am given the opportunity to report on the automatic defensive capabilities of the serpentine entity 722. First and foremost, the toxin is yet to be identified, unsurprisingly. When a person comes in contact with the poison dripping from its body or the gas it emits, they will fall ill almost instantaneously. Once the poison has entered a person's system, they are as good as dead. One can forget about an antidote, as all attempts at creating one have failed. Further testing is required as the panacea pills have yet to be administered to infected individuals. However, doing so in addition to normal testing of the poison prove extremely difficult. The poison is observed to disintegrate and becomes completely harmless after being removed from the cave. This means all testing must be conducted near the body of 722, putting everyone involved at risk of death. Some say that the poison is not for defensive purposes at all. Instead, it is to be used in combat against the God of Thunder. At least, that's how the myth goes. Also, it should be noted that the poisonous gas 722 emits is not as deadly as the liquid its body secretes. Still dangerous regardless. Explorations into the glacial cavern are forbidden, except in the case of maintenance. This is due to an incident where 722 has shown an increase in brain activity. Frightened by this, the Brigadier General of Site 103 has declared that anyone seen entering or leaving 722's cavern will be shot on sight, no questions asked regardless of their standing in the Foundation. I do not think he was kidding, as I have heard several gunshots in the middle of the night once. On my last day, I had the pleasure of witnessing 05-1 in action as he discussed with the Site Director and several researchers about what to do with 722 should it awaken. Obviously, the first measure to be taken would be to evacuate Site 103 and all nearby towns and cities. Researchers also believe that due to 722's sheer size and its tough hide, any attempts to damage it using conventional weaponry would be useless. 
Our only chance would be to have several thaumaturgical cannons on Site 103 to try and kill it, and pray to God it works. Should this fail, Site Director L has proposed getting SCP-190-DE to help in containing or even slaying 722. If the Nordic stories are true, then he might be our only chance. 190? Ugh, Thorsten Nordman? Love the guy, but he should not be counted on. Hasn't Thorsten declared himself the protector of Midgard? Surely, if we called on him to help with 722, he would answer. <laughs> you would think so, wouldn't you? Ask yourself this. Where was Thorsten when the Kaju wrecked havoc on the world? Where was Thorsten when SCP-6004 slaughtered millions? Thorsten is incredibly powerful. This is true, without a doubt. While he possesses power beyond imagination, he is incredibly out of practice when it comes to fighting. Moreover, we have him on phone records where we think he told his father, Odin, that he refused to fight the snake. As difficult as this may be to hear, Thorsten is a non-factor. Always has been, and most likely always will be. Site Director L fell silent as he realized he was unable to refute what his superior had said. But do not fret, we already have something in the works. Ever since the incident with 6004 and the Kaiju, we have been working on an armor dubbed Myonir Type 3. It is an advanced combat exoskeleton that fully seals around the wearer. It filters out all toxins and comes equipped with miniature thaumaturgical weapons. It also makes the user stronger and faster to the point that they become a god relative to humanity. Gentlemen, who would like to sign up and become a real protector of Midgard? No experience needed. Myonir has automatic defensive capabilities. Fair warning though, you'll be fighting entities on the level of gods. It was then that I raised my hand. I was accepted without question by the council. And while I have yet to begin testing with the Myonir armor, I could feel that the Foundation has gotten one step closer to securing, containing, and protecting our fragile little world with what it promised. Or so it would seem. Just then, my father burst through the door. No, the Myonir plan or whatever you have in mind must not proceed. The Jormungandr must not be disturbed. Father, what on earth are you doing here? Who is this man? And how did he get in here? Security! You must not touch the World Serpent, otherwise a great apocalypse will befall us. <laughs> what are you doing? Let me go! As he struggled to fight off the guard's hold, 051 walked forward and calmly dismissed them. What are you saying? What apocalypse? My father sat down to catch his breath. He handed me a couple slides and told me to put it under the projector. The first image showed a comparison between the frozen 722 and what looked like an ancient symbol, which looked eerily like 722. Jormungandr, the world serpent, must remain as it is. You see, the way it's grasping its tail? That's the Araboros, the seal that keeps the worlds balanced together. It must not be broken. I turned to the next image, which sent the room into murmurs. It was a series of paintings as well as carved ancient runes and scripts which corresponded to the ones on 722. The paintings depicted 722 now having released its tail from its grasp, engaging in battle against a few human figures. That's Ragnarok, or part of it. What you're seeing here is a fierce battle between two mortal enemies, Vormungandr and Thor, or Thorsten Nordman, as you call him. Wait a minute. You mean it happened before? Eons ago, Jormungandr released its tail and caused violent unrest. The serpent thrashed onto land and flooded it. It advanced and sprayed poison, filling the air and water. It confronted the gods, and Thor stepped forward to fight it. They fought a bloody battle that lasted days and nights. Ultimately, Thor was able to fend off Jormungandr and brought back Ouroboros, the balance of the world. But we still detect signs of life from this Jormungandr, and if Thor could defeat it back then, surely he can do it again, and more easily this time with our gear. He won only because of the help from other gods. Why do you think Thor didn't help fend off 6004? The poison of Jormungandr wounded Thor deeply. It almost killed him if it wasn't for Ear's healing powers. Even then, the poison had severely crippled him. Another battle with an entity of such caliber would mean certain death. The room fell silent. 05-1 let out a sigh 
and walked out without saying anything. Site Director L only patted me on my shoulder and followed 05-1. Soon, everyone left the room. Only me and my father remained. I looked at the image and shuddered. If the gods had this much trouble to contain that thing, what chance do we even have? I guess the glacier is the only thing standing between the continuation and end of civilization. I was an infant when the great serpent god attacked our land. Father said that it used its magic breath to burn away our cities in order to purge us of our sin and indulgences. That it roared and summoned the monstrous winds and waves to clean our lands and wash away the innocent blood spilled from war. How its body glittered the purest colors in order to show off its brilliance and majesty to us all so that we may never forget it. Father says that its eyes could see all and counted the transgressions committed by all swallowing up the impure and unrighteous. Its countless number of teeth chewed up the damned. The thing is, the righteous were not safe either, like they believed, for they too met the same fate. Father says that even the good-hearted were slain for their impassivity. The rainbow god would bring death to all it came across. When I asked what happened after it left us, my father smiled. It brought back the beauty of our land. He gestured, showing lovely green pastures and bountiful waters. But be warned, if we do not stay humbled and close to nature, the rainbow god will strike us down. Do you understand, son? Yes, father, I whispered, looking at the painting of the serpentine god stretched across the cave wall. Hello, everybody, I'm the Rubber. Today, we bring you a SCP Foundation Tiamat class object, SCP-6004. SCP-6004, also known as the Rainbow Serpent, is an unbelievably massive entity that resembles a monstrous snake that can morph its body to either be just over a tenth of a mile to as big as 1100 miles in mass and size. The head of the entity shifts between different species of ophidians, leaving its true face unknown. Puzzlingly enough, 6004's body is both at the same time tangible and intangible at random intervals and whenever it chooses to. Speaking of its body, it is mostly charcoal black, but with rings of different colors around its body. Two curved horns with the engravings of different animal species and a number of teeth impossible for any creature to possess. 6004 is able to propel itself through the air and water by moving in a serpentine fashion faster than the speed of sound. Due to its combined speed and size, its movements will cause tsunamis to form and sonic bursts to surge through the air. Mentally, 6004 is able to alter the weather across the planet simultaneously, whenever it wills it. Finally, 6004 is capable of swallowing and regurgitating anything that it wishes, but will often swallow animals only to throw them back up into where they belong. After the Foundation failed in its efforts to stop 6004, they decided to join forces with the Global Occult Coalition GOC, the Church of the Broken God, and Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited in the construction of a weapon, a long-range charged particle emitter, or Project Mongoose. A meeting was called by 05-1 following the failure of the prototype of Project Mongoose. A representative from each organization and Site-14's director, Alan Tibbles, were present. Oh, how the Great Foundation has fallen. Do you see now how containment of these creatures is pointless? My dear O5, surely you understand now that if you were as dedicated to the eradication of anomalous entities as we are, we would have the technology to kill this behemoth ten times over. That pathetic particle emitter barely hurt it. Do not speak to me about what we should have done. Billions are dead. Australia blown to ashes. Russia incinerated. The USA nearly underwater. Need I go on? The petty squabble we have cannot continue if we are to produce something to stop 6004. The prototype simply wasn't as ready as we thought. That is why we shall redouble our efforts and send a mongoose up into space for an orbital bombardment. But this time, it shall be bigger, more powerful. What does the Church of the Broken God think about this? I'm afraid I must concur with the GOC. If the Foundation was not so lenient with these despicable things, we would not be in this mess, especially after your Foundation has worked so tirelessly to thwart our efforts as well. The Mongoose prototype was, and is, a failure, 
due to you stifling the growth of true saviors. What say you, representative from Marshall, Carter, and Dark? I get paid regardless. I vote for whatever plan is decided on. Just keep us alive and I'll play along. Get you all you need. Listen to you all. Do you not remember how that damned beast shrugged off 12 nuclear warheads and sent the radioactive wave to destroy all of Beijing? Yet all you care about is attacking the Foundation? The next mongoose will be enough. We simply need more time. It is your fault billions died, not ours. Their blood is on your hands and yours alone. And now you want us to risk our lives in the construction of something that will most likely not work at all? Fat chance. Site director Alan Tibbles slowly stood up and looked at each representative one at a time, silencing them with a stern look. Things have not gone how we wanted them to. We all know that. The world knows of 6004's existence and possibly numerous other SCPs at this point. We could barely scratch this beast and you have good reason to believe we shall all die here. But you couldn't be more wrong. What are you suggesting? What I have to say is this. Our foundation has defeated threat after threat and extinguished every end of the world scenario, every bloody god, and every reality warping monstrosity you can think of, even when hope was lost. This is no different. We have saved humanity from destruction while you and the church of broken gods sat around. The representatives only looked down when called out. Tibbles continued, Every day we fail, yet we learn more about this creature. And do you know what our biggest advantage is right now? The world knows of all of our existences. We don't have to hold back anymore. Following this rousing speech, the representatives then agreed to work on the orbital mongoose and to dedicate all the resources they had in order to destroy or contain 6004. After the successful completion of an orbital mongoose, 6004 target a GOC site and promptly begin attacking it as it summoned the elements in a fury. Using this opportunity, 05-1 ordered for the mongoose to take aim at the behemoth. You have my permission to fire when ready, gentlemen. As soon as that weapon is ready, fire at it without a second thought. The beast has shown us no mercy, and so let us return the favor. A massive green energy beam that darkens the sky shot down at 6004, noticeably tearing and damaging its body, causing it to let out painful shrieks that shook the earth. Yes, do not let up. Give it all we've got. 05-1 and the representatives watched as 6004 attempts to flee from the particle beam while attacking the GOC site. Until it finally had enough, 6004 roared and with determined speed slammed its massive body down onto the GOC site, sending earthquakes throughout the area and nearly destroying the entire site. Full surge blast right now! I don't care if we destroy 200 miles of land, use every ounce of power we have. A massive burst from the particle beam slammed into 6004. The energy from the wave killed all life within 300 miles of the blast. 6004 was seen rising through the smoke and began to charge an energy blast of its own, disrupting the beam from the mongoose. After learning of its location, 6004 charged into space towards it. It approached the mongoose and used its maw to destroy the device before descending down to Earth as all of humanity feels their collective hope fade away. After 6004 came down from space, it disappeared for some time before being rediscovered at what is now Site 6004 in Walamai National Park in an underground lake deep in slumber. Many members of the Foundation, the GOC, wondered why 6004 ended its rampage so abruptly. Some think that after slaughtering billions, 6004 brought the world back to a state where it could be sustainable again and allow for the Earth to heal, to go back the way it used to be, before industrialization was brought on by humanity. Some thought that due to the Foundation working to transform the world into one that is more reliant on renewable resources, less mass urbanization, and the growth of nature at large, the Rainbow Serpent was pleased and returned to sleep. Both theories are believed to be true, as the destruction 6004 caused brought upon the prolific growth of nature and wildlife, and brought humanity down to a more modest population with less focus on excessive waste and consumption. However, the truth is, in order to prevent 6004's reawakening, 
Tibbles and Lloyd created 27 consciousness nullification devices to keep the beast asleep, to prevent another rampage. Amnestics were distributed worldwide through the air and water to keep all that humanity had learned a secret once again. The Foundation now tasks itself with ensuring the world follows strict environmental policies and protects nature, in fear of the reawakening of 6004. Ten years ago, in 1997, the Andes were shaken apart as a great entity stirred underneath. Magma burst up and flowed through towns and cities. Buildings crumbled from the intense tremors. Many lives were lost. Ten years later, the earth cracked open, allowing humanity to catch a glimpse of a titan that lives beneath the crust of the planet, the Earth Serpent. A base was set up around the cracked earth. Dr. Vasquez stood, staring down at the serpent. Any updates? Sir, its life signs are stable, but that's pretty much all we got right now. It could wake up at any time and there's no telling what kind of damage it will do when it does. As Dr. Vasquez observed the serpent, he couldn't help but feel that there was something more going on. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today, we bring you SCP Foundation Esoteric Class Object SCP-4568. SCP-4568, also known as Dilemma of the Twin Serpents, consists of two massive serpentine entities. SCP-4568-1 is a massive subterranean serpentine entity that resides below the Andean mountain range in South America. Current estimates indicate a length of at least 300 miles and a width of around 12 miles. The entity is animate and autonomous. It is composed of molten rock, highly compressed sediments, various metals, and ice. Sonar analysis have revealed the existence of artificial structures resembling clockwork, gears, and primitive circuits along the serpent's entire body. However, no studies have been able to determine a purpose to these structures, and they do not seem to be the mechanism behind 4568-1's autonomous movement. 4568-1 mostly remains dormant. However, at certain times, the entity displaces itself along the Andean mountain range. Due to its gargantuan size, this usually results in large-scale seismic activity of a magnitude proportional to the degree of displacement. These movements are in response to 4568-2 exiting dormancy, and the seismic activity is intentionally caused by 4568-1 in order to incapacitate 4568-2. Due to the significant casualties caused by SCP-4568-1, the entity was at first presumed to be hostile. 4568-1 is sapient, with above human intelligence, and very high mimetic resistance. While not actively hostile, it is aware of the casualties resulting from its seismic activity and considers them a regrettable necessity to restrain 4568-2. SCP-4568-2 is a marine, sapient, serpentine entity of comparable size to SCP-4568-1. It is comprised of water, sand, algae, and steam. It often incorporates extant marine life forms into its mass. These do not appear to be harmed by their absorption into 4568-2, although they exhibit some degree of usually beneficial mutation after exposure. Marine life forms have proven themselves capable of extricating and reincorporating themselves into 4568-2's mass at any time. 4568-2 is actively hostile to human life, having repeatedly expressed an intention to eradicate humanity. 4568-2 claims that its goal is to stop a great calamity that will result in the destruction of nature and the consequent elimination of all life on Earth. While at first this was thought to refer to some sort of ecological disaster, further statements by SCP-4568-2 now suggest that this would be a tangential after-effect of a MK-class end-of-human consciousness scenario of undetermined origin. 4568-2 is capable of using resonance effects and vibrations to force water and other fluids to take on specific shapes. It employs this technique to maintain its own shape during its active periods and to cause massive tidal waves and anomalous oceanic activity. The seismic activity induced by 4568-1 disrupts these abilities, making SCP-4568-2 unable to maintain a consistent form out of water and forcing it into periods of dormancy. Council, based on the assumption that SCP-4568 is a sapient entity and is actively hostile towards humankind, I, on behalf of my research team, pose it that 4568 should be temporarily neutralized. Temporarily? Why not just kill it? 
or better yet, contain the entity in order to study it. It is simply too large for any current technology to kill or contain. The logistics to do so would be a nightmare. Plus, I get the feeling it's not doing it out of malice. Doctor, you are a scientist. Unless you can back up your feelings with facts, I say that a permanent solution is required. We have to put an end to this menace. The rest of the council all nodded in agreement. Very well then, if we are to go down that route, my team and I have come up with a solution that may work against 4568. Let's hear it, Doctor. We will inject a hostile memetic agent via a payload. That's our best bet. May God see us through this. The operation began as planned. While the memetic injection failed to fully neutralize the entity, it succeeded in temporarily incapacitating it. A research base was set up around the unconscious entity to monitor its activity. Eight hours later, a tremor began to shake the earth. Deep rumbling sounds penetrated through the base's thick shield walls and shook Foundation personnel to their core. The entity had regained consciousness. All stations stand by. Get ready to fire. Wait, hold. The doctor and his team monitored their instruments as the entity remained in place. Over the following hours, it initiated a series of small but continuous tremors following a specific pattern. These tremors have a deliberate feel to them. Just like before, it's like Morse code. Morse code? That's ridiculous. Get the linguist and cryptologist. If it is trying to communicate with us, we need to figure out its message. And surely enough, a message was deciphered from the series of tremors and was translated. Humans of Foundation, are you truly the protectors of Earth and balance? If so, allow me to complete my mission. Or lies deep in the sea, fueled by fear and twisted righteousness. What I do is the only way to stop them. I regret the loss of life due to my actions every day. But to not take action would lead to ten times as many deaths. In the sea? Is there another such entity? If the message is true, it sounds like it's trying to prevent something terrible. But what? While the debate regarding the interpretation of the message was still ongoing, Foundation personnel received automated alerts of significant anomalous oceanic activity along the Pacific coast. Deep Sea Sonar was deployed, and a massive serpentine entity provisionally designated SCP-4568-2, apparently composed of water and unidentified biological material, was detected. It emerged near Chile, causing a large-scale disruption in oceanic patterns. Council. If we let this go on, it will result in more devastating tsunamis that will wash over coastal settlements all along the Pacific. Millions of lives will be lost. But what if 4568 is our only chance? In its message, it talked about fighting against a certain terror in the sea. And now the threat has showed itself. Surely it would be wise to ally with 4568 against the sea serpent. Can the memetic payload be used against it again? That's the best shot we have. This time, we'll use it against both of them. However, this time, both serpents resisted Foundation's attempt. Another series of tremors were registered, from which the following message as deciphered. I am very, very sorry. This is the only way. The Earth Serpent shook its body once again, sending great waves through the Earth and water, disrupting the Sea Serpent's form and thus preventing it from taking shape and causing mass destruction. The Sea Serpent's roar dissipated with the waves as it returned to dormancy. Though the Sea Serpent was stopped, a magnitude 8 earthquake was caused by the Earth Serpent's action, tearing apart coastal Chile. Again, human lives were lost. What do we do? The Sea Serpent was quelled by Earth Serpent, but at what cost? They're just fighting each other while humans perish. The Earth Serpent claimed to be fighting against the evil Sea Serpent to prevent the destruction of mankind. But what if it all leads to the same outcome? Can we really trust it? The doctor was devastated by the loss of life. He despaired at man's powerlessness in the struggle against two rival titans. He walked out towards the broken earth, where he caught a glimpse of the earth serpent's great body deep underground, pulsating steadily. Earth serpent, I don't know if you can hear or understand me, but if you are truly on our side, please give us a sign. We must stop this needless sacrifice of lives. If what you told us is true, we must work together. Moments later, the earth beneath his feet shook, and the Foundation's interpreters sprang into action. Foundation, I know you cannot trust me, much less while you are still mourning your dead. I know what I did, just as I know the extremes you are willing to go to protect your kin. Yet we will never be equals, even though we share the same goals. 
You know, my brother, who you call the Sea Serpent, also believes his duty to be of protection. There is a threat hiding beyond the stars, something incomprehensible, even to us. The human mind is a burning beacon in a sea of darkness. Would extinguishing it divert the attention of this threat? My brother seems to believe so. But I wonder, would it be worth it in the end? Dr. Vasquez was elated that he could communicate with the Earth Serpent and was excited by the possibility of cooperation. Of course it's worth it. The threat that you speak of will not stop at humanity. Soon they will come for you and your brother. And if we're gonna stop this threat, we need him. We need the Sea Serpent's power. Dr. Vasquez and his team waited, but the Earth Serpent did not answer. Days later, another set of tremors were detected. However, these did not originate from the Earth Serpent, but from the sea. Humans, I'm sure you can see it. How your world dies a little bit more every day, mostly by your own hand, no? You poison the oceans, tank the rivers, blacken the skies. You do not need angels of death to end your world. But there is something else, I see it in the bottom of your eyes. Something unforgettable, inconceivable ideas cloaked in madness and impossible colors. Do you think I will let you drag the rest of the world down with you? Do you think I will leave this world, my world, to die in flames? It's the Sea Serpent! Whoa! The Earth trembled as the Earth Serpent spoke once more. My brother, do you really think this death will solve it all? I can see the threat too. It hurts to think about it. I see it everywhere. The pressure, the suffocation, the dangers from beyond the stars. I know what will happen when it descends, and yet I think you are misguided. An idea exists only because some living thing was able to think of it. Have you even considered how such terrible concepts could have been given form? What if you were playing into the creature's hands? Why should I believe you? Why should I believe that such words come from anything but sheer cowardice? You know we have to do it. You protect the land, I protect the seas. And we both know what the enemy is. Yet here you are, protecting mankind. Even though they will be the gateway for the ones who threaten us. Foundation, do you want to know why I am protecting humanity? Wouldn't it be easier to just let go? And maybe letting my brother do what he wants will really stop the threat approaching our world? An easy exit. But that is something I like about you, about mankind. However tempting it is to take the simplest path to just give up, there will always be some among you who refuse this path. There will always be someone who stands up against the dark, even if it takes a thousand million years to emerge victorious. I will save this world, humans. You won't be able to stop me. This is the only way. And I will do the same, brother. I will protect humanity against the threat. And you. Following that exchange, the Foundation decided to allow the Earth Serpent's activity to go on unimpeded, and containment proposals are to focus on mitigation procedures, as this was viewed as the only way to prevent further losses. As for the threat from beyond the stars, its nature is yet to be determined. Engulfed in the dark waters, the Great Serpentine feels the rush of the sea once more. It feels the vibration, its brethren shake it, as if telling it to leave. But where could they go in this dark environment? It matters not, for it has found its prey. Forged in ancient magma, the shell of the destroyer glows and burns brightly. It breaks free from the ground which had held it for millennia to walk the earth once more, leaving fire and brimstone in its wake. Her memory is hazy, but she remembers how she had died and was brought back to this world by her devout followers, and of course, her violent skirmishes with the serpent. Dredged from the grave and thrown into the land of the living once again, the queen of the monsters let out a cry that echoes through the ages. Beyond the great deeps, the behemoths hear the call. They stir and rouse, a kingdom of swarming beasts, dozens of them, all powerful and mighty, awaken from their deep slumber. In the embrace of the abyss, the serpent grows restless. The old battle will repeat itself as it had in the past. Will this be the one that finally ends this vicious cycle? Though weary and tired of the violence, still it sharpens its fangs and readies to face its old nemesis once more. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today we bring you SCP Foundation Esoteric Class Object SCP-5391. SCP-5391, also known as Anastasis, is an anomalous event. It refers to the awakening of large-scale aggressors, or LSA. 
following the revival of LSA Brazil 01. These LSAs are collectively referred to as SCP-5391-1 in addition to their individual designations. In 1998, Foundation agents successfully detained and captured POI-2889, Stanislav Nikolev, a former scientist and director of Prometheus Lab, which operated the Anastasis Project, the revival of LSA Brazil-01. Brazil-01, dubbed the Queen of the Monsters, is a massive entity with the head of a crocodile and tentacles for its lower body. It was once considered neutralized, but was revived by Prometheus Lab. As a result, it is currently outfitted with large amounts of paratechnical components that further accentuate its abilities, most notably its regenerative prowess. Nikolev sat in Site-40's interrogation room. The television in the corner was showing news footage of the destruction caused by LSA Stromboli-08. He smirked the entire time as he watched the footage play. Stromboli-08 is an armored ankylosaurian entity. Its anomalously hard shell plating features numerous broad spines that end in a narrow point. The seams between these plates have a scintillating red glow, similar to that of molten rocks. Buried beneath the volcanic Stromboli Island, the armored behemoth burst through the earth, causing the island volcano to erupt. The island was engulfed in magma, and its complete destruction soon followed. Footage showed fighter jets engaging the beast, but were shot down by magma expelled from Stromboli 08's body. The head researcher of 5391, Dr. Mikasa Kaori, entered the room. She turned off the TV and sat down in front of Nikolev. Before she began introducing herself, she noticed Nikolev looking at her. He smiled wryly and glanced briefly at the people outside the room, then back to Dr. Kaori. I know what you're thinking and what you want to know, Dr. Kaori. It's just simply this. I believe the downfall of humanity is that those in power tend to believe themselves to be gods. Why do I believe this? Because I was one of those idiotic fools who thought they belonged to the pantheon of divine beings. The Anastasis Project was nothing more than a need for us to fulfill a self-proclaimed prophecy to prove that we were above even Mother Nature herself. We succeeded in reviving that gargantuan creature. Of course, with a few adjustments of our own to improve upon its natural design. After all, we had the power to do so, and we thought, why should we not? And that brilliant question has brought us to this. So, what was the price for our actions? The lives of everyone at the Prometheus Labs. It was nothing in the grand scheme of things. <laughs> it's quite a fitting name, wouldn't you say? for it was Prometheus who brought the gift of fire to humanity from the gods. We too brought a gift. We have revived a creature capable of threatening the existence of mankind, and man has controlled and ruined Earth for far too long. Right now, this world is being returned to its rightful masters, and I'm proud to admit that I have been an integral part of it. Just then, a message came through the speaker. Dr. Kaori, we've detected an LSA not far from the facility. It's about to collide with a civilian vessel, mobilizing all forces now. Fighting them is hopeless, Dr. Kaori. Just accept your fate. Wake 02 surfaced in the Pacific Ocean, about 12 kilometers west of Site 40. The serpentine behemoth approached a fishing vessel and struck. It lunged through the vessel and obliterated it instantly, resulting in multiple casualties on board. The Foundation's forces arrived at the scene half an hour later with several helicopters, two armed vessels, and the High Energy Concentration Orbital Railgun, or HECOR, primed and ready in orbit. MTF-H5 deployed from Dimensional Site 172 and engaged Wake-02. They attempted to use a binding field to put Wake-02 into stasis, but failed, as Wake-02 emitted a small-scale EMP that rendered the device useless. Back in the control room, Dr. Kaori redirected efforts to evacuate civilians among the wreckage. The survivors were scrambling to board a helicopter. Wake 02 noticed and opened its mouth, shooting out a second head at the helicopter and demolished it. Dr. Kaori ordered the anti-thaumatological cannons to fire. They successfully pierced through Wake 02 and damaged it to a considerable degree. The serpentine behemoth let out a shriek of rage 
and lunged towards the helicopters, destroying the cannons. Dr. Kaori then called for the deployment of Kikor. It took out a large chunk of Wake 02. The serpentine behemoth appeared to have been neutralized. But before Dr. Kaori and her team could celebrate, Wake 02 began to rapidly regenerate from all the damage it sustained. It shrieked towards the sky, as if taunting them for their futile efforts. Damn it! Dr. Kaori slammed her fist on the desk. Left with no other options, she ordered a full-scale retreat. Wake 02 disappeared beneath the waves soon after. The next day, Dr. Kaori arranged for a meeting with Site Director Simmons. Two days ago, something happened in Paraguay. An entire Foundation expedition team was killed. There are ruins there. Labyrinthine cave systems filled with remnants of an ancient civilization you've never even heard of. The higher-ups are starting to put the pieces together about why this is happening, what these things are, and what's about to come. But if you ask me, these don't even come close enough to giving us a solution. I trust that you have something else in mind, Doctor? Dr. Kaori nodded. She took out a blueprint from her folder and handed it to him. Simmons looked at it and smiled. <laughs> All right, I see. He pushed past the door and addressed everyone in the room. All right, fellas, stop whatever you're doing and listen. Lately, these big, ugly monsters have been kicking our butts. They did us dirty and got us by surprise. They've killed countless innocent lives, but no more. Now, we will fight back. We will show these monsters no mercy. We will have a monster of our own, because this, this is our monster. So let's build a giant freaking mech. Meanwhile, in the Wanderer's Library, the last thousand steps finally came to a stop at the bottom of the ravine. Samuel sat down in exhaustion, then looked up into the abyss of the library. No, this is no time to rest, he thought. I need to keep moving. He gripped his lantern tighter and stood back up. Suddenly, a voice spoke to Samuel from the shadows ahead. Uh, hello? He raised his lantern and took a few cautious steps forward. Soon, an old man appeared in front of him. Apologies if I don't look presentable. I don't get out much. Where are you headed, young man? Oh, I, uh, I'm looking for the history of Behemoth's section. The old man's eyes widened. As he moved to stroke his chin, Samuel noticed the serpent's hand tattoo on his forearm. Ah, I know of the way. Follow me. They arrived at the end of the maze. It was an open area with no bookshelves in sight, only torn papers and scraps of wood covering the floor. Then, an expression of dread crossed the old man's face. Before they could react, the library shook. The floor beneath them collapsed, swallowing them into the void. They fell and fell and fell. Samuel gasped and opened his eyes. He was back at the same spot he had just been standing, but the old man was gone. He began sprinting forward with the lantern in hand. After a while, he reached the bookshelves again. But this time, a massive silverfish about two stories tall came out of nowhere and swallowed an entire bookshelf. Samuel lost his balance and fell on the ground, catching the silverfish's attention. It charged forward, its legs violently pounding on the floor. Completely taken over by fear, Samuel froze like a deer in headlights. In a flash, something massive charged into the silverfish and crashed into the other bookshelves. Sounds of flesh being ripped apart followed, then gradually died down. Samuel crept forward and saw the serpent. Its jaws clamped onto the now lifeless silverfish before tearing it apart. Then the serpent reached into its stomach with its reptilian tongue, pulling out a mucus-covered book and flung it into Samuel's arms. Hands shaking, Samuel wiped the mucus off and saw the title, Extinction of Behemoths. For a moment, he was speechless. Samuel looked up and met the serpent's eyes. I can sense them. They have returned. Then I must go deal with them once again. The serpent flapped its plumage and ascended into the darkness above. Then all was quiet. The Foundation had found evidence of LSAs roaming the Earth far before our times, but they never found out how they had all disappeared. That was why Samuel was sent to the library, to find a way to defeat the newly arisen LSAs once more. He reached up, hands still shaking, and turned on his radio. Samuel now knew what had happened without even having to read the book. The serpent had killed them all, and it will do so again. 
In the beginning, the queen of the monsters fought valiantly against a god from out of this world. Along with it came other beasts who threatened the queen's throne. Through the ages, these beasts would come to be known as gods and worshipped. An altar built in deep sea by men who lost their lives in the process was dedicated to the sea serpent. The flaming beast stood atop the peak of the volcano, observing its followers who prostrated humbly before it. The hands of the outsider god touched the minds of five chosen ones and anointed them as holy priests. Then came her nemesis, the plumbed serpent that is all-knowing descended from the heavens and bestowed the fruit of knowledge upon mankind. All of this displeased the queen. She bid her time, waiting for the beast to go into hibernation. Then she destroyed the temple of the outsider god and struck down its followers. The temple burned and the outsider god's powers waned as its followers died out. The plumbed serpent fled, and the queen emerged victorious as the one true queen of the monsters. She reigned over mankind for the next millennia. When she died, her followers brought her back in a ritual. They offered their blood and soul, and carved their bodies in ancient scripts. As the queen returned, so did the other beasts. The beast wrought destruction upon the queen's followers. Chaos once again returned as civilization fell. With burning rage, the queen now bigger and mightier defeated them in a storm. She tore the plumbed serpent apart and cast it into the sun. In the end, the beasts who were spared by the queen bowed before her. The queen ruled the world once more. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today, we bring you SCP Foundation Safe Class Object SCP-5437. SCP-5437, also known as a beast cast from heaven, is a prehistorical religious complex in Paraguay. Research has shown that 5437's sole anomalous property is its ability to preserve biological matter for abnormal amounts of time, causing decay to occur at an exceedingly low rate. The true size of the site is unknown. The majority of the structure is located underground. Several hidden chambers and hallways have been uncovered behind the complex walls. Aside from these branching rooms, 5437 is mainly composed of a spiraled staircase that leads to a spacious cathedral foyer, which serves as a place of worship for SCP-5437-1. SCP-5437-1 is the carcass of a massive, starfish-like entity cataloged as a large-scale aggressor, LSA for short. It is green in coloration and has five thin arms that sprout from its center with each measuring approximately 20 meters in length. It resembles a serpent star and possesses hundreds of eyes on its central body disc. Its skin is impenetrable. As such, any attempts to dissect or examine the entity have failed. Etched on the walls is a series of historical artwork that displays a religious narrative. Arranged in a sequential order, the artwork depicts the battles between LSA Brazil-01 and 5437 one as well as other LSAs. In 1998, Foundation historian Dr. Emily Metcalf led a team to explore 5437. What follows are the journey entries written by Metcalf and his final recording towards the end. 19th of April, 1998. Daylight. Darnell helped me move the majority of my possessions to the cathedral area. I have everything I need here for the entirety of the mission. My bed, my archives, equipment, etc. I'm still not entirely sure what my purpose here is. They said only I would know what this huge entity is, that I'm the only one who can crack its code. Honestly, this place creeps me out. I don't know why I decided to set up shop right in the hall where this massive serpent star, the one we call 5437-1 lies. It's supposed to be dead and decaying. My assistant and the others set up camp just outside of the perimeter. But one thing's for sure, I feel attracted to it. There's a certain energy that has been haunting me ever since I set foot on site. It has led me to this hall, this creature, this god from beyond our world. 21st of April, 1998, cloudy. Looks like it's about to rain. I had a dream last night. I dreamed about the serpent star. It reached out to me and showed me things from before our time. I saw signs and symbols. It spoke to me in strange language that I somehow understood. I cannot recall everything now, however hard I try. The case of the mural remains. The story they tell is evident. A legion of beasts cast from heaven 
descended to earth to be worshipped as gods. Then, for whatever reason, they collectively went into slumber. Upon the arrival of an even greater beast, they awakened. A war was waged, and the beasts venerated their new leader after violent battles. I remember now, in the dream, it was the queen of monsters who devoured the lesser beasts and left some alive as witnesses to its supremacy. And what man doesn't follow the gods they worship? Thus, in return, humanity bowed before the queen. I look at the carcass now and realize that I have been avoiding it all this time. The serpent star invaded my dream once again. Its tentacle touched the tip of my head, and I began to see colors, colors out of this world, forbidden knowledge that we humans aren't meant to acquire. But why did it do this? Why did it show me all this, this terrible, terrible visions? What are its goals? I dare not to think about and make sense of it. Perhaps its goals are beyond human comprehension. One's mind will go insane trying to understand it. Ignorance isn't only a bliss, it is our safety net. Tonight, I study the murals again, as I observe the depiction of the battle between the tentacled crocodilian and the great serpent, I recall an image in my dreams. The serpent gave man knowledge, and the queen of the monsters despised it. And so, it tore the serpent apart and cast it into the inferno above. I got up in the middle of the night and started walking the halls. I followed one of the tentacles of the serpent star and discovered a hidden chamber. I entered, but all I saw were corpses. The men who built the temple, the men who worshipped the serpent star, some of them were coiled by the tentacle with the expression of bliss on their faces. The corpses stretched on for miles. Every stone in this temple was set by men whose names are forever lost. I found myself waking up in the chamber where the dead bodies lie. I'm beginning to lose track of time here. Found more artifacts today. A human skull with some sort of symbols carved onto it. A ceremonial dagger. And perhaps I'm seeing things. A chamber pot that somehow still reeked and stained with blood. Again, I recalled more images from the dream. The men had carved up their own kind in a barbaric ritual to revive the queen of the monsters. The ritual was a success, and the queen rose again. She defeated the other beasts, claiming the throne once more, and watched over her followers. But it's merely a means to a greater end. The cycle of war and destruction must continue. It's only a matter of time until these beasts rise and clash against each other again. I wonder, how long did it take for it to die? Is it even dead, or is it simply in the last stages of its life? This decaying serpent star, the outsider god, has spent millennia dying and dreaming in its own temple, patiently waiting for the next cycle to come. Like a fool, like a crazed lunatic, like someone affected by something out of their control, I went ahead and touched the carcass. And in that instance, it pulled me into a vision. The serpent star appeared before me, its hundred eyes opened and looked into my soul. Its tentacle reached out and touched me on the forehead. It began to speak. Quinn Kraken, the queen of monsters. The devourer will rise again. The cycle will continue. Destruction is nigh. Judgment is upon you. Its stare grew more intense. Images of destruction seared through my mind. In seconds, I saw cities falling large behemoths rising from the sea and walking the earth, men becoming cultists and killing each other in the name of this twisted ritual, all in order to preserve the cycle and the serpent clashing against the queen of monsters. I woke up in a cold sweat. I looked around the hall. Everything was still the same. The vision and its voice were still vivid in my mind. The eyes on the carcass remained closed, yet I could still feel them watching me. The queen had died again and again. And each time she was brought back to this world, she became stronger. I shudder to think when the behemoths walk the earth again, how many more lives would be lost? How many more worlds will these titans end before the cycle finishes? This carcass, this beast, this god taunts me with all these visions and its vague words. This is not a temple, but rather a tomb filled with dead people to prolong its life. It has the power to drive men insane, the power to resurrect the dead, the power to awaken the beasts from their deep slumber. I must escape from the inevitable destruction when these beasts arise once more. I must escape now. But where else can I go besides death, the great beyond? <laughs> Call me a coward, 
but I do not wish to live in a world you're going to be in. No, sir. No way. The serpent star appeared in my vision again, its hundred eyes looking straight at me. I'm no longer afraid. It must have heard what I wanted. Come, it said to me, and reached out with its tentacles. I'm no longer afraid. Soon, I'll be joining the dead in this place, watching the world from above, observing the destruction, the madness. And so, the cycle begins anew. The journal entries ended there at the time of recovery. On the 27th of June, 1998, 5437-1 released a large emission of Elan Vital Energy, killing all personnel stationed on site. A large portion of 5437 was destroyed in the energy blast. However, the body of Metcalf was found perfectly unharmed. The incident occurred within the same time frame as Prometheus Lab's revival of LSA Brazil-01 and the subsequent awakening of several LSAs across the globe. The event is cataloged as SCP-5391. Shrouded in thick fog, the mech stood. It observed its surroundings with watchful eyes. Suddenly, multiple arachnid-like entities manifested in front of it. They stood on only two legs, brandishing the rest. The mech unsheathed its sword and dashed towards the nearest entity. With one swift motion, it slashed and cleaved the entity in half. Though split, the top half preserved and fought on as it attempted to jab at the mech. It was then quickly dispatched with a few more stabs of the sword. One of them latched onto the mech's shoulder, a fatal mistake that was quickly punished. The mech activated its shoulder-mounted railgun and blasted the entity into oblivion. Suddenly, the surroundings were plunged into darkness as the sun was blotted out by yet another entity. A massive serpent with verdant plumage descended upon the battlefield. The snake of the garden, descending from heaven, bearing the fruit of wisdom. The serpent's emerald eyes glowed white. It swung its tail and slammed down on the remaining entities, killing all but one. Now, kill the beast and seal our pact. And the mech struck down the last remaining entity with its blade without hesitation. Perseus, Mikasa, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today, we bring you SCP Foundation Thamiel Class Object SCP-5514. SCP-5514, also known as the Dragon Slayer, is a massive humanoid mech constructed by the Foundation with assistance from the Global Occult Coalition. It is currently being utilized as part of the Defense Against Large-Scale Aggressors, or LSAs. There are some anomalous features that warrant its designation, one of which involves the usage of a pocket dimension that significantly lowers the mass and weight of 5514. As for its power source, SCP-037, a small star approximately 5 centimeters in diameter that contains the energy of a sun, has been implanted into its chest cavity. Along with a giant sword and a plasma-bladed hat, one of 5514's most anomalous weapons in its arsenal is the Thousand Word Arrows. It involves seven poets writing and reciting poems about the defeat and death of monsters which in turn empowers 5514 with divine energy while demoralizing enemies at the same time. In 1998, LSA Wake 02 made its appearance near the Bay of Tokyo. Wake 02 rose from deep beneath the dark waters and let out a deafening cry that summoned lesser LSAs to join in its conquest against mankind. They advanced towards the city and laid waste to it, Coalition forces from the GOC and the Foundation went in to intercept the threat, but to no avail. Satellite footage showed images of the Bay City burning to the ground, and towering monsters appearing in and out of the smog as massive hysteria broke out, a grim portrait of the cruel fate befalling humanity. Above the skies of Tokyo, just below orbit, Captain Perseus Rosales, a trained Foundation asset piloted 5514 gearing it up for its first combat mission. As Dr. Mikasa Kaori gave the thumbs up, the formidable mech word as it came alive. Hydraulics? Checked. Heat sinks? Checked. Armaments? Checked. All systems ready to go. And so 5514 descended onto the Earth, like a meteor falling from the sky, and landed in the sea. 
the massive mech rose unscathed from all the sparks and embers. 5514 detected Wake 02 almost immediately, as the entity was quick to launch its first strike on 5514. It lunged at 5514, but the mech evaded with ease. 5514 and Wake 02 then regained their composure and began studying each other. During that time, the city was in the process of evacuation. However, many residents stopped their attempts to flee and gazed upon the magnificent sight the two titans at sea. Target locked, engaged. All right, you ugly bastard, let's do this. 5514 prepared to rush forward. But instead of engaging the mech, Wake 02 let out a roar and quickly slithered its way towards the city. Oh, I won't let you get your way. Seven figures emerged from the midst of the evacuees and walked towards the bay. These were the poets of the Thousand Word Arrows. Waves crashed upon the harbor as the poets stood steadfast, facing down a massive serpentine monster that was approaching ever closer. Then they began to recite, Champion, Champion, exalt in the glory of the Dragon Slayer. Upon hearing the words being broadcast from 5514's pataphysical mantle, Wake 02 halted its movement towards the harbor. It instead let out a loud shriek, calling aid to its side. The LSAs rampaging in the city ruins heeded its call and converged towards the sea. Soon enough, 5514 was surrounded. 5514 leaped into the air, removing its rounded recoiling plasma and throwing it at a nearby LSA. It arced across multiple targets. Upon return, the entities fell with their heads cleanly separated from their bodies. The surrounding waters turned crimson with the blood of the fallen monstrosities. The vicious beasts slain, gone to those which were once bane. 5514 then unsheathed the cold iron sword. It thrust down into another LSA and stabbed at its heart as it fell to the ground. 5514 pulled the sword out from its dead body and slashed the throat of yet another LSA approaching. To your right, Dr. Kaori shouted. The mech backed away from its position and activated its flight system to remain in the air. Wake 02's second head then protruded from the mouth of its first head. It let out another shriek and more LSAs rose from the seabed to answer its call. The second head shot towards 5514 with great velocity, just barely missing its foot. A lesser LSA scampered up the extended appendage and pounced on 5514. The mech managed to deflect the attack, then cut down the entity mid-air. Nice try. And now, my turn. 5514 launched into the air and activated its shoulder-mounted railgun, the Beowulf Seaguard Rail. It took out the eyes of Wake 02's main head. It shrieked in pain and clumsily retracted its appendage. Seeing how Wake 02 was hurting, 5514 seized the moment by propelling forward and striking at the main head. 5514 descended upon Wake 02 before piercing its head. Then it flew over Wake 02 and drew its blade down the entity's serpentine body, dragging it all the way to its tail fin. The beast was split in half. Each half twitched and squirmed for a moment, but finally it lay dead. Dr. Kaori, LSA Wake 02 has been eliminated. 5514 stood tall as the riotous waves slowly died down. It turned to face the poets at the harbor. They nodded at each other, then puffed up their chests and recited the thousand word arrows once more. And the beast torn asunder, exalt in the glory of the dragon slayer. The people cheered as the words boomed loudly across the bay. It had given them hope of rebuilding and fighting back. However, the peace was short-lived. After the demise of Wake 02, LSA Brazil 01 was spotted off the coast of Greenland. 5514 was deployed to neutralize it. This time, Captain Rosales was accompanied by an ally, the Serpent. 5514 dropped from orbit as the serpent emerged from the waters off the coastal tundra. A storm was already brewing to welcome them. With their backs against each other, they scanned the area vigilantly for any sudden attacks within the storm. I see him, Quinn Crake, the one you called Brazil 01. Soon enough, the sky darkened, storm clouds rolled in, and it began to rain. 
Brazil 01 burst through the waters, letting out a thunderous roar and crashed onto the serpent. They wrestled against one another. The serpent coiled around Brazil 01, while Brazil 01 had its rear tentacles wrapped around the serpent. Farther out on the coast, aiding the battle from a distance, were the seven poets of the Thousand Word Arrows. They could see the silhouettes of the massive entities engaging in fierce battle far out into the sea. Braving the storm, they watched the clash between titans and recited the words, The awaited battlefield, the destined place for the beast to die. One final, just death. 5514 charged through the waters to assist the serpent. It grabbed Brazil 01, tearing it away from its ally. The mech pulled the beast into the air and hurled it down with great force. However, it had no effect on Brazil 01, as it quickly rose and turned to face the duo. 5514 drew its sword, holding it against Brazil 01. You all right there, Snakey? The serpent had been bitten multiple times and was bleeding heavily. It flapped its ruined plumage to shake off the blood. These are deep wounds, but I will live. As 5514 activated its railgun, Brazil 01's mouth and cybernetic plating began to glow. It was charging an orb of blue energy inside its mouth. It turned into an energy beam and destroyed the railgun in the blink of an eye, staggering 5514 greatly. The beast then lunged across the battlefield, now faster than ever. The serpent moved in front of 5514 to intercept the attack, but to no avail. Brazil 01 ran past the serpent with ease and seized the 5514's sword. It swung the blade back at the mech, cutting off one of its legs and shattering the cold iron sword in the process. Next, it turned towards the wounded serpent. Brazil 01 used its many tentacles to propel itself into the air. Using the power of gravity coupled with its sheer mass, it dropped down onto the serpent. Forming multiple sharp points by grouping its tentacles together, Brazil 01 stabbed at the serpent relentlessly as Captain Rosales watched on helplessly. Damn it! Damn it! What can we do? With 5514's system failing and the serpent heavily wounded, Brazil 01 raised its head to the sky and breathed a torrent of flame in a display of dominance. But all hope was not lost. There was still one final weapon left undeployed. Undeterred by the dire state and devastation in front of them, the poets revealed 5514's trump card. The greatest weapon you can offer is that of your own heart and the light of your soul. My own heart, light of my soul, that's it, soul, I got it now. 5514 struggled to prop itself up. Then the mech angled its chest towards Brazil 01, who was still roaring loudly. Powered by the energy that's equivalent to that of a sun, the emergency sun vent drained every last bit of the mech's power and shot out a burst of immense heat and energy, obliterating Brazil 01 and blinding the entire battlefield. As the battle was won and the storm has ceased, the serpent slowly rose above the tumultuous waters. And so it's done. The beast is slain, sent to the great beyond. The serpent rises, Return to from whence it came. We hope you enjoyed today's video. Don't forget to click like, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell. Have a favorite SCP you want to see on this channel? Leave us your suggestions in the comments down below. In the meantime, if you'd like to see more SCP content, then check out some of our other videos right here. As always, thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in our next video. Bye bye.